in the series on First Things First, and we are looking at uh, this week um, the fact that the Lord is God and He is good. We're going to read from Psalm uh, 100. 25 verses. It's a psalm which we know so very well, and oftentimes, I can't tell you how many times down the years I've been in ministry now for uh, around 30 years or so, and I can't tell you how many times I've used this as a call to worship. I have never actually preached this. I've never preached on Psalm 100, and so I had to write a fresh, brand new sermon. It's how about that? Um, when I haven't preached before, shout for joy to the Lord all the years. Worship, other versions will have serve. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Again, my thanks to Maggie, who, picking up the theme for this morning, enabled uh, a space for us to meet with God by his Holy Spirit uh, so very well as we began to explore something of God's goodness and heard something of that and enabled us in our song uh, worship, in our prayer worship, uh, etc., together this morning. So, the call to us this year is for us to glorify the Lord. I'm going back to Psalm 34. You'd, I spoke on that last week, Psalm 34 and verse 3. Glorify the Lord and to exalt his name together. Glorify the Lord and exalt his name together. Uh, in years gone by, we may have done bookmarks. See, bookmarks is, the, is a thing, isn't it? But then people don't read so many, so many books anymore. Um, Oh, it's in the back of the phone now. Oh, yeah. right. Oh, that's interesting. So there's a thought of having your verse on the back of your phone. Hey, in the old days, we would, have, we would have sometimes done bookmarks and other things like that. So we remember this text for the year. You will have your own way of memorizing that and where to put it to keep it at the fore of your memory. This is our first priority. First things first. That which is important, vital, important. Someone said to me, I was talking to uh, last week, and they said to me, it's a bit like John Major going back to basics. Yes, it is a bit like that. Those of you who remember that kind of stuff, if you want some political commentary with your sermon on a Sunday morning, it's uh, going back to basics. Worship the Lord our God together. Now, this word together is an important word for us um, because it's uh, you know, um, uh, and I think I want to spend some time just exploring that word a little bit um, because of its importance. The word together, coming out of this pandemic, which has caused a degree of scattering among us, and there has been a degree of scattering among us. Of course, as a church, the whole point is that we come together and then we scatter and we go into the week as we scatter, and this is what the early church did, right? You come together in the meeting places and in the temple courts, etc., uh, and they worship and they praise, and then they scattered. We do exactly the same. Um, but there has been a, a kind of scattering among us, which has affected us, because that scattering means that um, we've become a little bit more uh, fragmented. Uh, it means that we are not quite as together as we once were. Um, it means that our sense of community uh, has been affected because of all the lockdowns and things like that, which is still so evident, and some of us are still living with the legacy of that. Um, uh, the sense of community uh, was impacted. Um, we could not do the most basic of human functions, which is about um, socializing, it's about touching, it's about being together. That's what community is. We, we were made to be community people. I think I've got Genesis. Um, have you shown it already? Because if you have, I haven't seen it. Okay. Genesis 2.18. Uh, then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. You see, we are not meant to be alone. And we struggle with being alone. We're not so good at it. 
Of course, we go away for moments of solitude. And our Lord Jesus himself took time away to go and have solitude and time to be with God the Father. But this sense of being alone, uh, this sense of being a recluse, this sense of being the only person around with nobody else, we weren't made that way. We never did cope with that. And God, in all his wonderful good work, of creation so that it wasn't good for us to be alone. And that's why God made a suitable, a helper, a helpmate. So this impacted us. Indeed, some of us as a community, I'm still reflecting on why the word together is such an important word for us. Um, some of us um, would have lost loved ones. Um, uh, some of us, because some among us have died. And some among us are spiritually hurting because um, we've lost loved ones. And that sense of bereavement has been so intense that we are still hurting physically, um, emotionally, and spiritually. Some of us are scattered, displaced because we're trying to come to terms with all of this still. For different reasons, some have less left our community. Uh, you know, some have moved up north. We think of people like uh, Evelyn. Uh, I got an email of her. I was talking to Ella, and I know she's heard from her too, but I got a couple emails uh, from Evelyn. It took a, I, I answered the first one quite quickly. The second one took a while for me to reply. She sent me pictures of the view outside of her window and all this kind of stuff with the uh, snow and the, on the trees and all that sort of thing and telling me a bit, a bit about life up north. And uh, she's settling very well, and she's getting stuck in into her church, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but the point I was making is that some have moved churches; they've moved areas because of the natural consequences of life, life decisions which have made. Even as just one example, uh, while others have struggled to return to this physical building because they still don't feel quite able, for whatever reason to come back and physically worship, to worship in person as we are gathering together. And everyone is looking to the Lord as we seek to work out what the new normal is. That's in part what the uh, leaders meeting will be about later on today. We're still trying to work out our church, like so many other churches, if not just about every other church, what is the new normal? Of course, we can't define it uh, absolutely categorically now, but there were changing uh, shades of it as we go along. What does that look like? And in the midst of all of that, God comes to us and reminds us that we are to stay together. In the midst of all of that, God comes and he says, now stay together. Keep your focus on me, he says. Delight in worship in me. That's your role. You play your role. I will build my church. Your role is to stay focused on me and do it together. So for me, uh, the emphasis this year is going to be about what it means to be together. Now, this togetherness, please, may I say at the outset, does not in any way imply or mean that we have not been uh, together in the past. But there is a different quality. When God says it, you have to explore and say, well, so what does this look like? What does this quality um, of togetherness look like? And being in the same space doesn't mean that we are together. Being in this building doesn't actually mean that we are together. Yes, we occupy in the same space in this auditorium. Being online and wherever people are, albeit we are, and so we caught together like that, doesn't necessarily mean together. There's a depth to the, this togetherness, which is what I want to suggest is where I believe God has taken us to and encouraging us to move into uh, this year. Um, I think it is to do with having a vision, a common vision. This togetherness is about being one in heart and mind and purpose. I began exploring this a little bit last week. This togetherness is contained in our covenant, which we prepared uh, for you and which we made available electronically uh, and uh, also in paper. Uh, we prepared for you about walking together and looking over each other. 
This togetherness is about working out our differences. It never ceases to amaze me and it hurts my heart. I tell you, it hurts my heart that still I come across people who carry things which have happened for so long. Now I know we don't forget. Things have happened to me that I've not forgotten. But friends, the Bible, when it says that we are to forget, what it means is not to never ever remember things have happened because we're not built that way, we will remember. It means don't hold it against each other. And we as a community, there are too many of us still holding things against each other. And I am thinking that our God is saying to us, as you come into this new year and as you exalt and worship me together, stop carrying those things. Stop holding it against each other. Release it. Let it go. Lay it at the foot of the cross. Forgive each other. Forgive each other. Do not hinder the work of the Holy Spirit. Because I think this togetherness, the quality of this togetherness that God is calling us to, is one which allows the Holy Spirit free reign in the community. And he's not hindered by all the barriers and all the walls that we have built up. Because this person has irritated me, that person annoys me. And look, this will happen. But work through it, the Lord says. I have things about me that irritates the pants off you. I know that, I'm not silly. But you have things that irritate the pants of me. And I hope you know that. But we need to work that through because God has called us to be together and together with a common vision to build his church under the inspiration and direction of the Holy Spirit. Surrender to the Lord who is active in building his church. Our sense, when we heard this message, when Gladys and I were together, was about doing it together. Uh, Ephesians 4 is being quoted on the right-hand side in the black uh, space. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Jesus, in the final moments before his arrest, prayed for unity in the church. I read somewhere recently, leave this for a little while, please. I read somewhere recently that actually there is more talk about unity in the New Testament than there is of heaven or hell. I'm not sure if that is true. I haven't checked it out. So I can't confirm that to be the truth. But even if it's not actually true, what it's, the point is still being made, there's a lot of talk about unity. And we act as if it's not important because we all into the age of human rights and freedom and do what I want and all that kind of stuff. Uh, God paid the highest price for his church. That's the price, Jesus. It is very valuable to him and he wants his church protected. So Jesus calls us all to work hard for unity. Jesus calls us all to work hard for unity. So I want to ask you next time, I want to ask you a question. Something to ponder. I believe that it's your responsibility as it's my responsibility to protect the unity of the church. There's a thought to ponder. It is your responsibility to protect the unity of the church. Every single one of us who call ourselves Christians, definitely if you're a member of the church, but all who worship within this space and who call themselves Christians, it's your responsibility to protect the unity of the church. Your responsibility. I am going to, I know communion service tends to be a little bit later, so I'm not going to push my luck here. Some of you don't like the language of push my luck, not spiritual language, I know. And the pastor is saying push luck, I know, I know. But um, some responses. As you think on this, this is not your definitive come back on it, but as you think on it, what's your initial response? Online, talk to me, please. I've got my chat box open. Um, it's your responsibility to protect the unity of the church. Have you thought of that before? 
And, and, and if you have, what have you thought of? And if you haven't, and you're thinking of it now, what immediately crosses your mind? Just a little bit of interaction. I could preach and we can all go home, but hey, come on. Let's do some talking together. They say this is the new normal, you know, to stop these long, long, long things up the front and do more. Yeah, all right. Be sensitive to each other. Uh, says Keith, for those uh, online, if you want to know who's saying it. Oh, Ellen says, be forgiven. Be sensitive to each other. Uh, be forgiven. Yeah. Yeah, declare. Wow. So, declare says, there's no unity with me without you. That's profound, isn't it? Oh, my word. So, um, that's in part, that's touching on the whole Ubuntu thing. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Other thoughts? Not for long, because it's 25 past 12, and I need to get through my sermon. Just thought I'd tell you the time. I am aware of the clock. <laughs> Worst thing for anybody up front to do is to tell people the time. <laughs> Any other thoughts? It is your responsibility to protect the unity of the church. Anybody brave enough to say you disagree? Desire. Maggie would like the insertion of the word desire somewhere. Okay. You can put desire if you want. I don't like desire. I like responsibility because desire kind of like says you could desire but not. Responsibility is kind of like you have to. <laughs> she wants both okay Maggie wants both Ellen says again unity starts with you the, the letter U oh Ellen steady on girl oh look at you oh oh yeah look at you <laughs> sorry sorry that just caught me up there <laughs> See Jesus and ignore us. Oh, in other, oh, I beg your pardon. See Jesus in others. Yes, so Salome says, see Jesus in others. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Each of us made in the image of God. Yes, Sheila. It's not about me, it's about us. Wow. I would love that to be a slogan of the church forever. <laughs> it's not about me, it's about us. It's not about me, it's about us. Uh, Peter is saying, together is we, individually is I, our community is all of us, together, warts and all. Warts and all. Where's your double L in all, Peter? You've only got one L. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. He's going he's gonna to do me in now when I give him a call in the week. <laughs> Just having fun, bro. Okay, I'm going to move on. I, I just wanted to spend a few moments reflecting on that. Um, I'm, I'm sure we'll pick it up in our growth groups. Um, I hope that um, there were uh, 19 or so people uh, online um, at the service this morning. So I'm hoping that there will be um, uh, chat rooms and they can pick up some conversation uh, there too. Now, I don't think that, uh, as I said, it means that we haven't been together in the past. I believe that the Lord is... Um, uh, challenging us and calling us, um, mandating us to go deeper uh, this year. Um, means that we have to work harder at our togetherness. Uh, our world is incredibly individual. And we know that um, COVID and all that has gone with that has um, fed the monster that is called individualism in our world. Uh, and even as we, um, uh, we verbally said and emotionally crave uh, community, nonetheless, uh, there is something about the individualism which is monstrous and has got a hold of us. And so we have to work uh, against that, um, really, as we move forward. So community will inevitably mean the sharing of our lives. You know, all what we've just said just then is good. But friends, it's so 
frightening to so many people in church life because it means that we have to open up to each other and we don't like it. I don't care what you say to me. I'm going to tell you, Hispanic church, you don't like opening up to each other. We don't like doing it. There are so many of us, we use all kinds of languages, whether it's shy or private or I've been hurt in the past. I don't know what we say. We have many ways of saying it, but the reality is we do not open up to each other. It's vulnerable. Um, and yet, authentic community, authentic Jesus community is a community where it's not about me, it's about us. It's about how we live together. It's about opening up to each other. It's about appropriate disclosure. No, I'm not saying, and I've said this for 11 years among you, I'm not saying walk around let everything hang off and let everybody know everything. That, that will drive everybody mad. But it is about being more open with each other and sharing with each other that we may actually uh, be the church that God has called us to be that we may be the community he's called us to be. You know, I find us, I think we can be quite contrary as humans, uh, we humans, because with our words, we cry out for something, but actually by our very actions, <laughs> we deny the things that we're crying out for in our words. Uh, we're quite contrary, quite contrary. I might be in too radical or controversial. Or I'll move on quickly. Half past. I'll go fast now. Psalm 100. Ray, he's going to talk about Psalm 100. <laughs> Psalm 100. The psalmist says that everyone, everywhere is to lift a great shout to the Lord. Everyone, everywhere, lift a shout to the Lord. The psalmist is saying, wherever you are, whoever you are, lift a shout to the Lord. Make a joyful noise is how we talk about it to the Lord. And, you know, so when you start saying to me, well, I can't sing. I don't have an Ellen voice or a Maggie voice. Nobody wants a Maggie voice. I didn't say that. <laughs> Actually, I better, I better be nice. Her husband is here today, so I'm going to be in big trouble. <laughs> When you say to me that you haven't got a voice, you can, who cares? The Bible says, make and shout to the Lord. You can shout. Now, I know our British uh, private way of life and being will not allow us to carry on that way. When you travel to other nations, I remember years ago having the pleasure, many, many years of going to uh, Brazil. Oh, my word. Oh, my word. Everywhere you turn, people were not backwards and coming forwards. They know how to make a noise to the Lord. They know how to sing his praises. And it was the young people who were doing it. It blew my mind all those years ago. It was the young people who were at the forefront of this. And they were the ones uh, preaching and taking the music and all this kind in the, church, in the church. It wasn't oldies like me and Maggie and others. It was the younger people who were doing it. Shall I stop mentioning your name? All right. You were the one who celebrated your big birthday the other day and made a big thing about it. Everybody knows your age. <laughs> shout to the Lord. It's, let's notice that this is in the very opening verse. Shout to the Lord as we assemble. It's as we assemble, we are to be joyful. You know, I'm glad there's laughter in the church this morning because for too long we have made the church to be this terribly somber, what I call solemn joy. It blows my brains out. This thing I call solemn joy where we all sit very solemn, all respectful because there needs to be decorum in worship so nobody can laugh, nobody can enjoy themselves because joy is that deep thing that God gives us. Nothing to do with laughter. Nothing to do with having fun. Well, God gives us fun and laughter too. Why can't we bring it into the church? Why do I suddenly, Rupert, being the person I am, have to suddenly go all, now I'm being pastor of the church, I have to be all proper. I can't do it anyhow. Elam keeps telling me, you never can do it for more than five minutes, pastor, if you could last five minutes. True? Yes, true. Why do we do that? 
I know different cultures and all that kind of stuff. I'm not being silly, but hear the challenge of the word of God as we assemble. Be joyful as you worship, as you serve. Do it with gladness. Do it with gladness. Do it with gladness. I know, I want to say to the psalmist, really, you weren't writing for British culture, were you? Because I don't think you're getting that right. Actually, it's not just British culture. When I go to the Caribbean, I don't quite see the joy there to my home island. I don't quite see it either. I see a lot of stuff which is very much like it is here. But then um, many, of, many from here took the church there, so they kind of like follow it anyhow. Um, there was tremendous joy when I went to um, Calcutta during my presidential year. It was great to see the joy, the sense of excitement. And I don't know what God made of it, but for me as a human being, the sense of gladness and the rhythm and the joy when they come together, uh, I just think is great. When I look at those who worship here after we do at two o'clock, uh, the Tamil speaking church, Philadelphia, the sense of joy that they bring to uh, worship and the rhythm and the, the atmosphere that they create, I love it. And I think, oh, great. I love it. But hey, that's me. As we assemble, the psalmist says, do it with joy and with gladness. As we assemble, our will has to tell our mind, which has to tell our body that this is a joyous occasion. You know, in every other aspect of life, when you express joy, you don't sit there all quiet and all nice and stately. In every other aspect of life, when you're joyous, you express yourself. Your hands are going and your body is going and all manner of stuff's going. Apart from church. Not in church. Because that's not how you do church. And I pray that the Spirit of God will break through and break that stronghold among us. In the name of Jesus. I'm not asking you all to become swinging from the chandeliers, whatever people. Because we ain't going to do that. But you get the point I'm trying to make. Friends, it's a privilege to worship the Lord our God. I believe the psalmist is calling all the disciples to worship joyfully, simply because we're grateful because of what God has done for us. We are simply grateful for what he's done for us. He's our creator. We belong to him. It is through him we experience salvation for he. And we've been thinking about that at the table here this morning. We've been singing it. We have think about Emmanuel, God with us, we think about the incarnation where God took on flesh and came to dwell among us. And this God is the one in Jesus who went to the cross and enabled us to have a relationship with God again because once we were enemies and now we're friends with God and we're restoring that relationship. So the psalmist says, when you come together, be joyous. Be joyous. God is so good. He took my sin. Now I am free. We are his people. The sheep of his pasture. He's a good shepherd. He's a good shepherd. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. That's who I am. Verse 3 tells us that we could be, um, well, let me look at verse 3. Verse 3, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, see the us, we are his, we are his, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. There is a sense in which that could be, of course, in, um, 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 interpreted in a corporate way. So I have done the individualization of it when I talk about our individual salvation. But when we come together and we think about the church, there's a corporate coming together, which I want to equate with Israel because the psalmist is writing in the Old Testament. And it's about the people of God, a united people of God, all belonging to Yahweh. These people who were in slavery and God came and freed them from the slavery. They were in oppression and God came and released them from this oppression. And he took them on a journey and he formed a covenant with them, having crossed the Red Sea 
and all such things. And then he forms a covenant with them where he declares his love uh, for them. And he travels with them. His presence was always there with cloud and fire. And God was present amongst them. And then they entered. And we, did, we studied this as we looked at Joshua recently. And then they entered into the promised land. And God was with them. Us and we. Us and we, together, let's exalt his name together. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. We are his. Peter in the uh, uh, New Testament in 1 Peter will talk about a covenant of people and being built into a temple. And remember some months ago, I don't know, maybe a year ago, we studied that as we went through it together. There's so much of the New Testament, which is about us as a people belonging to God. Now, that said, we do not worship, we do not serve because of what the Lord has done for us. Not only just because of what he's done for us. We worship and serve him because of who he is also. I like what uh, Louis Gigolo, um, a, a biblical scholar, has to say on this. He says, worship is our response, both personal and corporate to God for who he is and for what he has done, expressed in and by the things we say and the way we live. So it's not just what God has done for us, but it's also because of who God is. He is good. Verse 5 tells us that God is always good. And that means he's always ready to receive us, always ready with open arms to receive us. His love endures forever. This is a love which will not be put out. This is a love which will not be diminished. This is a love which will not be lessened. This is a love which is a deep, intense, faithful, passionate, ongoing, eternal, amazing, and wonderful love for you and for me. So we worship him and we praise him because this is who he is. This is his character. This is an attribute of God. This is who he is, unchangeable in this. God can be trusted. He keeps his promises. And he does that to every generation, the psalmist says, because the psalmist said generations. So to every generation, God does this. So the worshiper's heart is one which is full of thankfulness. Always full of thankfulness. Enter the gates with thanksgiving and travel deeper into the courts with praise. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5, be thankful in all. Maggie quoted this earlier on. Sorry, I said I wasn't going to use your name. Our lead worshiper quoted this earlier on. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to uh, Christ Jesus. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and travel deeper into his courts with praise. I was playing around with that a little bit earlier on in the week, and I didn't put a picture up on the screen, but I just want to say quickly in passing, because when you look at the temple and you, you saw the gates, so you enter into the gates, and then you go from the gates into all the inner courts, and there's lots of inner courts, and then you go beyond the inner courts until you get to the place of the Holy of Holies later on. And I began wondering, I wonder if the psalmist is thinking, enter his gates with thanksgiving. So you're full of thanksgiving as you enter the gates on the outside, and as you go deeper your thanksgiving enter into praise because you're going deeper into God and when you get deeper and deeper you're getting deeper into the very presence of God I just wonder am I being too fanciful have some fun with that and see whether you think uh, there is something in that I intrigue over this sense of movement contained in the psalm it tells me that worship is not in itself the shout you see when you come and you shout that's not in itself the worship Worship is not in itself the singing. Worship is not in itself the thanksgiving. Worship is not in itself the praise. Oh, that's looking small. I'll read it in a moment. Worship is not in itself these things. Worship is the encountering the person of Jesus. That's the worship. These are things which enable us to get into the very presence of Jesus as we encounter his presence. Sorry, I wanted to read it. Can you go back, please? So I wanted to quote Graham Kendrick, who wrote a very good book a long time ago now, but a very good book on worship. Um, and uh, he said, of course, many of us will know Graham Kendrick uh, of old. Uh, worship in truth 
is worship that arises out of an actual encounter with God, a response to the experience of knowing God's real presence and activity in our daily lives. This has nothing to do with sentiment, thinking, religious thoughts, or having aesthetic experiences. In, in other words, uh, the spirit falling on you and you're falling all over the place or laughing or whatever. Uh, aesthetic experiences in the church building, any religion can give you that sort of thing. It's about an encounter. Now, not, none of those things are necessarily bad things, but worship is the encounter. And if we start looking for those things, we miss the heart of worship, which is that encounter with the living God. This is what God delights in. He delights in fellowship with us. He always has delighted in that. It's being in his presence. And yes, I know this is a very complex thing for us to cope because God is omnipresent. So that means that God is not only just present here, he's present when I leave this building in a few minutes to go home and he's present during the week as I go to work. And he's present when I go uh, running as Vicky does or I don't know, whatever other exercises other people do, etc. He's present there. So what are we really saying? It's hard to understand, isn't it? Because he's omnipresent. And yet there is something here about entering into his presence. There's something here about the tangible presence of the living God. And as I've thought about it during the week, I want to say to you, friends, and this you know, there is something about when we come together um, uh, in this corporate way where there is a presence which cannot be uh, understood in any other way than when we are separate. You know, I was looking at one or two ex examples of that. Um, at this table, we were thinking of the disciples uh, in the upper room. You know, it was in that upper room at Pentecost that the church was born as the Holy Spirit came upon them. It's as, the, as they were gathered together. In that same room before that, it was as they were gathered that Jesus came amongst them. If you remember, that was the Sunday when Thomas decided that he wasn't going to come to church, that he wanted to just, uh, he had a hard week working, and he just wanted to stay home and relax that week, because, oh, come on, he's there most weeks, and nothing much happens anyhow in church. And that's the week Jesus showed up. You know, there's something about when we come together and worshiping as a, as a community, brothers and sisters together. There's something there where God, uh, about the power and the presence of God, which is not otherwise. It was last week we were talking about the presence of God, and I don't have time to go into that again this week. <coughs> Excuse me. When we were, <laughs> uh, that was coming too quickly. I couldn't do anything about it. When um, it was Efe who said, you know, talking about, um, you know, Peter and the, the disciples in the boat worshiping Jesus. Um, and uh, he was saying well, there was something different about that. There was something different about Jesus being amongst them in, in, that, in, that, in that space. There was something different, which it's hard to find the words to explain. And, and I've been a Christian for so many years and a Christian leader for so many years. And I don't know the words to explain this. And I've never heard anybody explain it. And I can't myself explain it, but I know I have felt it. Am I making any sense or am I just, are you all thinking, Rupert, now it's just gone quarter to finish? Am I making any sense? There's something. Uh, friends, First things first, draw closer to Jesus. We do that when we pray. We do that when we read scripture. We do that when we walk in the spirit. We do all of that. I showed this slide because last week it was up at the front end and we, it got skipped and I wanted, I wanted it to be included this week. The most common mistake Christians make in worship today is seeking an experience rather than seeking God. We all want the experience. Rick Warren, and I'm happen, I happen to agree with him, otherwise I wouldn't put it up on the screen. <laughs> he would say, actually, it's God you seek, not the experience. Not the experience. 
It's not the healing. It's not the shaking. It's not the laughing. It's not the, all the other stuff, which is what happens when we're in the presence of God. It's the meeting with God himself and then allow God to give good gifts. Am I making sense? It's just uh, uh, something about this, which I think is so important for us to come to grapple with. Please, let's come back to this as we go uh, deeper into, into the year.